Hey, great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Naeem Darguth. I'm a research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, and uh, today we'll be uh, presenting some work that uh, we have been um, working for a, a couple of years now with a number of academic partners uh, led by uh, Ken Gillingham, who is our, uh, our speaker today. Ken Gillingham is a professor of uh, economics at Yale University and the School of Environment. Um, the co-authors on this uh, study are uh, Brian Bollinger, who's a professor at NYU, uh, and Andres Gonzalez from PUC uh, Chile. Um, so a couple of kind of logistics. We will have um, a Q&A session at the end of the uh, presentation, but do uh, feel free to enter questions as we go. There should be a Q&A uh, button that you can directly answer. For clarification questions, um, we can kind of, uh, the other co-authors are on the line, and we can try and answer them as we go. And for the larger discussion questions, we'll leave to the end, but no need to wait till the end to enter your uh, questions. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on uh, the Electricity Markets and Policy website after uh, the conclusion of the webinar, actually probably in about a week. Um, and I should also note that there is no uh, published paper uh, for this work as of yet. But if you are interested, we will be able to send you a, a draft version of the paper, which is to be submitted shortly to uh, an academic journal. So with that, um, Ben, I will leave it to you. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks so, thanks so much, Naeem. So I'm going to share my slides right now and, uh, and get started. Um, I have uh, about 23 slides, so I don't have a huge slide deck. Um, the goal here is to go for about half the time, roughly. Uh, giving you the, the talk and then um, spend, have plenty of time for, for Q&A at the end, That's the current plan. So hopefully I'm uh, all set. Um, I should also say along with the Q&A, we do have uh, Brian Bollinger and Andres uh, on the line here as well. So if you type things into the q and I might not get to them until the, the end, but uh, they may be able to, to respond to you as we move along with, with questions you might have. Um, so this is a paper on understanding the co-adoption of rooftop solar and energy storage. And it's funded by uh, US Department of Energy uh, SEEDS-3 grant, so under the Solar Energy Technologies Office of the US Department of Energy. Um, so standard legal disclaimer, these are just our views, of course, um, and we thank you, we thank the OE. Um, but the motivation behind this is when you're thinking about battery storage and solar, it, you start to see some really interesting analogies to, to other products. Uh, many products have complementarities. Uh, you could think about a classic case of an accessory, so you have a video game console. I remember Nintendo from a long time ago. Um, and then a game that is, is very, very exciting to people. They might buy a video game console just for the game, just for that accessory. So that the ability to access some accessory uh, can really influence the demand for initial uh, products and enhance the value proposition. And that analogy is, is a, an interesting one when you kind of apply it to the, the battery uh, and, and PV uh, context. So this is a study that's about examining these complementarities in the demand for rooftop solar and battery energy storage. Um, note that calling battery energy storage an accessory pretty much is saying that you don't generally use battery energy storage or can do battery energy storage on its own. Now, of course you can. Some, pe some people have battery energy storage, but it's actually a really tiny fraction of the market. And in general, when people just want pure backup, they tend to get the much more cost-effective home generators rather than just battery. So, uh, but there are a few cases of some people who say have a shaded rooftop and, and don't get batteries, you know, they can't get rooftop solar, but do get a battery energy storage. Um, but we're not gonna focus on those because they're really very unusual cases in our data. 
um, pretty much what we see is if you do get battery energy storage, you're getting it as a co-adoption with rooftop solar. Um, and the degree to which the value of adopting solar is enhanced has a, a whole set of implications uh, for policymakers and other stakeholders related to pricing, how, how, how the response to subsidies work. So this paper is gonna dive into understanding this battery storage entry. So this battery storage was not really an option until a few years ago, home battery storage, spur the demand for solar PV. We'll be focusing on the residential and small scale context. Now battery storage is obviously very interesting at the utility scale context, but that's not this study. Um, we're gonna be focusing almost entirely, pretty much entirely on small scale and almost entirely on residential context. Um, and then the second question is to what degree does, is, is the value proposition for solar adoption, quote option storage increased due to outages? So one of the reasons why you might get battery storage when, you have, when you're getting solar anyway is because of the possibility of outages uh, and backup from those outages and being able to use your solar uh, to, to back yourself up. It may also be some, some grid independence types of, of motivations. Um, and so thinking through what those motivations are helps you understand what might be going on in, in, in this context when you're talking about co-adoption of solar and storage. One of the challenges that we have is an estimation challenge. So there could be uh, high degrees of complementarities between solar and, and batteries. Um, so there's an arbitrage opportunity with time of use pricing. I mentioned before, if you have outages, this could, you could see batteries as a defensive investment against that. It also could increase people's feeling of control. These are real complementarities where batteries coming in can actually increase the value of solar PV. So basically you get more value out of having solar PV because you can use it in the evening uh, after the sun goes down when you have a battery. So it's like this, this added value you, you actually can get. But of course, more environmentally aware consumers might also value both products. Uh, so it could be what is called correlated consumer preference shocks. And there, battery entry wouldn't be increasing the value. It's that these people are more environmentally aware, or more have strong environmental preferences anyway. So our whole kind of uh, effort here is to try and disentangle those, those two components. What we're gonna do is we're gonna leverage nationwide household level data on solar installations. There's variation on battery entry, on incentives and power outages. Um, and we're gonna uh, first provide some evidence on uh, the determinants of PV battery co-adoption, focusing on outages, uh, just providing some evidence showing that, that outages do influence PV and battery co-adoption. Uh, then we're gonna estimate what's called a dynamic discrete choice demand model of residential solar and battery investment. So this is a model where we are uh, allowing consumers to be forward looking. So they are accounting for the fact that solar prices could be coming down in the future, battery prices could be coming down in the future. And then we're gonna run what are called counterfactual scenarios. So what is the world, what if scenarios, what would the world look like had say batteries not been available at all? Had say outages gotten much worse um, or, or major defensive investments were made by utilities to improve outages. So you could think about climate change uh, leading to worse outages and, and um, through wildfires, et cetera, more, more uh, public service PSPSs, uh, for those of you in California, uh, power shutoffs, public service power shutoffs. So, so outage intensity is something we're gonna vary and explore that. And then we're also gonna explore price subsidies. The context here is rooftop solar panels and residential uh, batteries that really became an option after uh, 2016, um, you know, barely anything before then. So it's very new technology, which is very interesting for us. Uh, you know, the post rebate price for solar panels on average in our data is about $20,000, the capacity of around seven kilowatts. The main manufacturers of residential batteries in, in, the, in these data are Tesla and LG. So we're talking about the Powerwall and a standard LG Chem uh, home battery is what we're talking about. Generally, the system capacity is under 20 kilowatt hours and the average is is 19, although there are definitely systems that we see that have 30 kilowatt hours, et cetera, 30 or 40. Um, you know, one of the things is for around, around 20 kilowatt hours, typical house, you can power a house for quite a lot of time. And note that if you have a solar panel and have it linked up to the battery, 
once the sun starts shining the next day, you could be in a, a position again where you can um, where you can uh, power your house straight from the solar panels. Um, you know, you probably can't charge an electric vehicle. You probably can't dry clothes, maybe, but you can, you know, keep your battery, keep your refrigerator going, and do all standard normal things. Um, it is true that you're paying more for it. Thirty-two percent, you know, more expensive when you co-install a system. Um, and I can actually take a quick look here just to show how this, this post rebate price goes. So we start adding the batteries. The batteries have been getting bigger over time. That's part of the reason why this uh, delta between these two has been increasing. But generally, PV is getting cheaper, um, and batteries have been getting slightly larger and cheaper per uh, kilowatt hour. Um, not so much in the past couple of years. Power outages. So we bring in 3.4 million outage events between 2017 and 2021. This is a fairly representative sample. It comes from poweroutage.us that reports outage data from utilities all across the United States. We don't claim that it's comprehensive. It doesn't include every single power outage, but it includes a lot. It has real-time tracking of 143 million utility customers in the US. And it tells us things like the number of customers about power per city time, when these happen, et cetera. And we couple this with the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs tracking the sun work on nationwide solar and storage residential installations. So we have down uh, at the individual level, individual installation level, the system price, the rebates, the location, the installer, the manufacturer, et cetera. Quickly to show the total number of megawatts of solar installed, as you probably know, has kind of steadily been increasing over time in the decade between 2011 to 2021. It's continued to increase since then. But this is what you see with PV battery. A small amount have been co-adopting since, since 2017. Um, and so you can kind of see the total solar adoption is broken, can be broken down into those who just install solar and those who install solar plus battery. And that's what uh, this area is, PV, PV plus battery is making up this wedge. And this, the, this uh, distance between those two is the same as, as that there, just a different way of looking at it. Um, you can look at across states too. So as I said, until 2016, this wasn't even a market. I mean, this is all pretty new. Um, by 2021, about 10% of total solar capacity was generated uh, by co-installed systems, 20, of, of those installed in 2021, right? Um, so it's, it's starting to become a reasonable part of the market. It's increasing further, uh, actually, is the best of my knowledge. We don't have the data for it, but we, we know that, this is, that these are the trends. Notably, California dominates. California is uh, over 80% of the number of, of solar watts that are co-installed, um, but, but then it's a smattering of, of other states that have uh, co-adoption occurring. On the power outages, is a wide range of outage exposure. Um, it's interesting to see uh, the, the places where the outages are the most prevalent. So Minnesota actually kind of wins here with the most outages and California is not the worst, despite what you might think, despite what I thought I should say. Um, this is the county level average number of hours of power shutdown per housing unit per quarter. Um, and so, so we have some pretty nice data that, that can tell us uh, about the outages across locations. Interestingly, 76% of the outages happen during the day and the mode of the outage starting time is 1 p.m. I'm gonna quickly flip to this because this is pretty interesting. A lot, you know, I always thought outages generally occurred at night. A lot of outages actually occur in the, the late afternoon um, and, and early evening. Um, so that's a lot of that time is still time when, when the sun is shining. Uh, so batteries would kick in at this time um, and obviously they kick in here. But uh, during some of these outages, the the um, the solar can actually, when you have a coupled system, the solar can actually kick in right right away. Um, now, of course, if it's a huge storm, uh, there might not be a lot of generation happening, but it can help for keeping a refrigerator going, for example. So it's pretty that was pretty interesting. Um, there's a little bit of Greek in this slide, but let me give you in English what we're doing here. Uh, we're looking at the relationship between outages over time on the adoption of PV only and PV plus battery. So solar only or co-adoption. And we're looking at this uh, across the entire country and we have a whole bunch of controls for a variety of other things that could be confounding this estimation. So we're basically looking at the log of, of, of adoption here and we're looking at it over time. And, and by time, what I mean is time since the outage occurs. And what do we see? Fascinating uh, results to me is 
you know, so the, the, the actual outage is occurring around here. We see this uh, real boost of PV and battery um, in the following quarters. So it takes some time to, uh, to search for an installer, for sign, have them um, check out your rooftop and all those things, sign the contract, get it installed. So it makes sense that it would be several quarters later. But there's, there's a, a, a real jump uh, within a few quarters um, of an outage in um, co-installation uh, that occurs. Whereas for PV alone, we see it kind of, kind of flat lined uh, when you look across the United States. So that's also some, some already interesting evidence that power outages are, are playing a role here. In order to dive deeper here, uh, we're going to um, develop a dynamic demand model. So we're, we're going to be modeling the household's installation decisions. So you're a household, you're thinking about, ooh, what am I going to do? I'm going to choose an installer first, and then I'm going to choose PV only and PV plus battery. Notably in our sample, some installers don't offer PV plus battery and that, that's incorporated. So if you, you can choose an installer and you know you wouldn't choose an installer obviously if they don't offer PV plus battery if you want PV plus battery. Um, so we have uh, this in, in technical terms, this is a nested logic framework that, that we're gonna be doing here. Um, but we allow people to, to have the, to account for the option value of waiting based on expectations about future market conditions. So they're, they're looking forward and saying, well, okay, prices of, of solar installations have been declining. So I know that there's some value to me waiting a little longer and I'm weighing that against the fact that I kind of want solar right now. So that comes in. Um, this is uh, technically how we do it. We're gonna use conditional choice probabilities uh, and we're gonna be using some instrumental variables to try and account for uh, standard demand endogeneity concerns. So these are going to be things that shift supply around. Um, if that's too detailed, I won't get further into them all. I have, a, I have some nice detailed uh, slides with more math for you. For those who are excited about them, you can read the, the paper. Um, but it's a, it's a, I, I'd say kind of pretty close to the cutting edge of, of how people are are doing uh, demand modeling these days. Let me talk about the demand estimates uh, quickly. Uh, I, I, I'm going to mention this, but I'm going to start here with the, the post rebate price per watt. For when we, we estimate the model without the instruments, that's what this column is. It, we basically get nothing. When we estimate it with instruments, we get relatively sensible values for the price per watt. So we see it's it's negative, and this gives us an elasticity that is is in lot well in line with the, the literature. Um, a very sensible elasticity here for uh, when you change the price what that means for how many people purchase uh, solar or, or solar and storage. Um, the, the other thing that to mention here is we also look at the outages. So this is the cumulative number of hours that an outage occurs. Um, so we have the cumulative number of hours that an outage occurs and we also interact this with, with whether you co-install. And so what we see here is, is if you've co-installed and you have more out more hours, of an of outage, your uh, probability of adopting is increased. That's what this positive coefficient means here. And I can get into to the, what it means kind of in terms of uh, percentage increases, but it's, it's a notable percentage increase. Um, so outages really are, are playing a role in this. Um, this effect is a little different in California, which is the next slide actually. So we can look at, um, this uh, this is for for everywhere, um, but in California it's a it's a dampened it's still a, a positive effect by those, but it's a, a dampened effect in California. And you can also note that um, if you didn't co-install, which is this row here, you see that there is a positive coefficient in California, which which we're just kind of fascinated by. It suggests that in California, if there's a set of outages. A bunch of people right after getting those outages uh, will, will be installing solar, even though the solar in general doesn't actually provide a defensive investment, doesn't actually back you up. There's certain inverters, and we actually looked into this, like what percentage of the sample are getting an inverter that allows you without storage to, to back up. They're, they're entirely niche. They're, they're almost nothing. So it seems that outages just make people think about having solar more in California, and they don't 
seen to in the other states, which, uh, which is a, a really quite interesting finding. And we'll, you'll see that some more. So what gets to me even more exciting, at least from my perspective, is getting into the counterfactual uh, exercises. We're gonna use demand estimates to study these research questions. We're gonna ask how much did the introduction of PV and battery, this option becoming available, contribute to the total adoption of solar? So basically, what would have the world been look like? What would the world have looked like had PV and battery not even been available starting in 2016, which is what was occurring beforehand? How much of this demand would simply disappear? Next question is how would solar adoption change if the level of power outages increases or decreases? So with climate change, we could expect potentially more power outages, but we could also see real efforts being undertaken by utilities to underground power lines or uh, or otherwise um, increase the reliability and, and, and reduce power outages, uh, tree trimming, et cetera. So um, here we have PV and battery. Here it's you know, this defensive action for power uh, shutdowns means that uh, a higher exposure to outages may lead to a higher generation of, of solar energy, which is kind of an interesting result. We don't, nobody wants power outages, <laughs> um, but it may have this, uh, this additional consequence of, of after a time of power outages, you might get a, a jump in solar energy uh, um, uh, installations. And finally, how much would adoption increase if we offer price discounts? So we simulate adoption under different schemes of price incentives. So first one, does battery storage entry contribute to the adoption of solar? So here we're simulating solar adoption a setting where PV and battery is removed. So if PV and battery is removed, this left-hand side says, how would adoption of solar change? What we look at is how many people would have adopted PV only anyway, and how many would switch to what's called the outside option, basically not adopt anything? And there's actually a, a pretty reasonable fraction of people who uh, adopted, co-adopted PV plus battery, who if the batteries were not available, would have done nothing, would, have, would not have adopted anything at all. And that's what's shown in this red area here. And this is just a cumulative version of what we see here in the left-hand side. So the right-hand side is just a cumulative version of the left-hand side. These uh, values, megawatts, these are not huge, huge values. So I, I recognize it's not an enormous number of megawatts that that's affecting, but it actually gets at important behavioral considerations uh, about what's really going on in driving the, the, the adoption decision. So put it to summarize it, 80% of the PV and battery demand switches to PV only and the remaining 20% goes to the outside option. Um, and so we're talking kind of in the 50, the tens of, of megawatts. Next is the role of power outages. The value of a PV plus battery increases with power outages. That's not surprising. You would think that would be the case. So if you're at a place that has a lot of power outages, I, I happen to be in one. I'm sitting here in a, a very wooded area of Connecticut and we get several outages every year. Um, the value of, of PV and battery increases with, with power outages. Of course, it may actually go the other, other way if everyone already has a, a generator. Um, so several people on my street have generators and, and they're like, well, I don't really need a battery. I already have my generator. Okay. <laughs> um, but you can see what we're doing here now is we're going to simulate storage and solar adoption by varying the county's average level of outage intensity. And this is what we see. So on the x-axis, we change the outage intensity. And on the y-axis, we see the change, the percentage change in storage capacity. So if you ha have more outages, total storage is, is increasing. So this is 20% more outages. The change in storage capacity goes up, I don't know, it looks like around 75%. Um, and and uh, if you have fewer outages, it, it drops by 50%. But we can also look at the change in solar adoption. And obviously the percent change is gonna be a lot smaller because this is the base that's much larger, um, but it also influences solar adoption as well uh, because outages are, are entering into in, in technical terms of the utility function or, or the, the choice that these decisions, uh, that these consumers are making. We allow outages to, to play a role in the decisions that people are making. Let's dive into California. I gave some evidence already about something different going on in California. So this is interesting, what I think is a very interesting comparison of California versus other states. And to be clear, it really is California versus other states. We actually separated out other states, played around. Is, is there another state like California? 
for those of you who live in California, you may be proud to know that there's no other state quite like California. Um, but, uh, but you know, we'll, there's a higher penetration of PB and battery in California. There's a whole different thing, set of things going on. There were recent major outage events in California, such as the Pacific Gas and Electrics, uh, public service uh, power shutoffs. Um, so what we see is that the change in outage intensity, and you look at the, the fraction of solar co installed. So first of all, the level is much higher between California and all the other states. The co-adoption is much higher to start in California. But, uh, but the slope is actually similar, maybe a little steeper. Uh, so it's primarily a level shift up and, and maybe a little bit of the slope being slightly steeper. Well, that's not probably, that's not gonna be statistically significant. So, so you see a much higher co-installation fraction in California. Um, but it gets to, to a more interesting story here when we actually look about uh, what people would have done if batteries were not available um, and how that changes with, with power outages. So here on the left-hand side, we have all the other states. And on the right-hand side, we have California. So this figure um, is telling you what the change in outage intensity does to the change in percent change in solar capacity. So it's a very similar figure to, to these figures, right? Total storage, total solar. Um, so here's this, the, the total solar, change in outage intensity in California. Uh, it increases, same here. So we have the change in outage intensity by 20%. You have more outages, you're gonna have uh, more solar capacity. You would particularly have more solar capacity because you have more PV and battery. However, some of those who adopted this PV and battery chose to adopt the PV and battery because uh, instead of adopting PV only. And that's what we see here. So PV and only is negative. So people are not adopting PV, uh, they're not adopting PV only because batteries are available. And so they're adopting PV and battery. Uh, and so when outages increase, you're basically cannibalizing the PV only group uh, and shifting them to PV and battery, to co-installation. California is slightly different. And this gets back to what, what uh, I was talking about before with those coefficients. So here in, in California, we see a, you know, you increase the outage intensity. So you have more outages in California. And with those coefficients that I showed you before, I'm actually gonna flip back to them really quickly. You have this, some of this, these positive coefficients here uh, and the negative coefficients here, which basically are saying that when outages increase, a bunch of people in California, this is the positive coefficient, are going to be buying solar anyway. So, so an increase in outages increases co-adoption, but it also increases just PV only, which is different than any other states. And that was fascinating to me. So total solar actually increases by even more. In some sense, you could say people in California are even more responsive to outages than in other states. So a 10% increase in outage leads to an increase in solar capacity by 8% in California and 1% in the rest of the country. Finally, we're gonna to get to the role of financial incentives. And I'm right at halfway point, so and I have a couple, two slides left. So this is two or three slides left, so I'm right on time here. So the role of financial incentives, state and federal programs that offer rebates for installing solar technology. There's, there's the, the California SGIP provides incentives. Um, as an example of this. So we're gonna run a counterfactual exercise. We're gonna reduce the post-rebate price by 20% for the, the PV and battery systems, it's similar in magnitude to the SGIP, and look at the effects on solar and storage capacity and look at the substitution that occurs. Basically, are we gonna be, how much are we actually gonna be increasing total PV only, uh, total PV, the aggregate PV of both, uh, or how much are we just, you know, switching people between those two technologies? And that allows us to calculate some return on investment types of calculations. So here are the effects on adoption. Well, let's start on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, we have all other states in California, and we have the effects on solar capacity in megawatts. So we have PV only, PV and battery in total. And this shows the, the solar capacity increase uh, in megawatts of capacity. So when you uh, put in this 20% price reduction, 
California gets a big boost. This is consistent with what I was saying before, the, the responsiveness in California is greater for PV and battery than it is in other states. Um, a whole bunch uh, are gonna be shifted. I mean, so in both from PV only to PV and battery, but you do see an increase and it's a greater increase in California than in other states in the total amount of just solar capacity. On the right-hand side, we can look at the effects of uh, storage capacity and we can kind of see PV and battery and obviously total of PV and battery are pretty much the same. So we see a greater increase in PV and battery. And this is again, consistent that in California relative to other states, we do see more responsiveness to uh, price changes or outage changes. People are just more responsive in California in, uh, in being induced to, to uh, adopt PV and battery. So providing a 20% price reduction increases storage capacity by about 11% and 8.3% in, in California and 8.3% in the other states. There is a high substitution between those, those two technologies though, or technology options. And you can do some quick uh, calculations of return on investment. Um, finally, we can look at return on investment and I'm just kind of skip that to, for, for time reasons. I wanna make sure we have time for, for questions. We do can look at the return on investment and in power outages. We can look at change in, in outage intensity. And, uh, and so the re, it's an interesting, the return on investment um, actually slightly de declines with more outage intensity because basically people are gonna be adopting uh, solar and storage anyway. They're gonna be induced to, to get solar and storage anyway. And that's sort of, some of them are at least. So that's sort of what's, what's going on there. So you'd get, the, the market gets bigger for, for co-adoption when you have more outages. Uh, the return on subsidy investments actually declines somewhat. That's pretty flat though, rel relatively flat. Um, so to finally conclude, oh, that came out funny. Um, in this project, we study complementarities between solar and storage. Um, this is an ideal empirical setting to disentangle preference correlation from complementarities, which is really what we're gonna be doing. That's kind of at the core of our model. We do find that consumers increase valuation of solar when PV and battery, when the PV and battery option is available. And we do find strong preference correlation. So 80% of PV and battery adoption is cannibalized, would have not taken place anyway, but would have come, been coming from uh, PV adoption. So would have uh, been solar adoption anyway. Um, but power outages appear to be a very important factor in the co-adoption co decision. They clearly increase the value of storage, increase the co-installation rates and thus spur the adoption of solar. Um, California, it's an even strong, in California, it's an even stronger effect. Um, and California is at a higher base level already of co-adoption. Um, and then incentivizing storage. Well, it increases adoption of storage as intended. It has only a small effect on aggregate solar due to the number of people. If you incentivize storage, a bunch of people are gonna be switching from getting PV only to PV and battery substitution. And then there are gonna be some people who would have not bought PV at all, gone down the track at all who are incentivized to, to, to co-adopt because of the more affordable PV and battery substitution option. So with that, I'm, I'm at, at the end of my slide deck and I'd love to take some, uh, some questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, there are quite a few of them here I've noticed um, and some are getting answered, which is, is great. Um, so I think uh, Naeem, I will pass it back to you to, to moderate um, going forward. Um, but thank you all for your attention. As Naeem mentioned, uh, we have a, a draft just about, you know, we're still polishing up about to submit it, but it's, it's ready to, to be shared with, with anyone. And we'd love your, your feedback and, and thoughts on, uh, on this work. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ken. As you noted, yeah, a number of questions have already been um, uh, posed and answered. <laughs> Um, so I, I think uh, Andres and um, Brian have been good at uh, answering the questions as you go. Um, so please do enter additional questions uh, in the Q&A. Again, uh, just click on the Q&A um, button and enter your question there and we can, um, we can address them now. So we have a healthy amount of time, about 25 minutes. Um, or as long as, as we need to, to answer these questions. Um, let's see. So there are a couple that have been answered that perhaps we can um, re 
revisit or, or maybe discuss a little bit um, in a little bit more uh, depth. Uh, so, so one question uh, is the California correlation with solar only uh, and outages a function of the long lead times on batteries. Many people tried to install batteries, but it was taking multiple years to get them installed, um, which is uh, uh, an interesting point. But it, see, um, Ken, if you have any any thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, Andres already answered and said that we don't have a decisive explanation about why California is different than, than the rest, and I think that's true. Um, I think that the fact that California has this um, longer, slightly longer lead times. Now, one thing to note is that there are long lead times in, in many states. Um, California is not the only state with long lead times, but California absolutely had long lead times for, for quite a while, um, where it took multiple years to, to get installed. and um, that could, should the California lead times be significantly different than the other states, uh, that could be a potential explanation. Um, I don't think that would be the only explanation, but I think it's a, a really interesting point, um, uh, that, that could be playing a role here. Um, I think several things are going into to play in, in the difference between California and other states. Uh, great. So we have a question here, um, <clears throat> I may have misunderstood your description on the graphs and discussion on the relationship between power outages and solar only adoption. The graphs show a negative relationship, so more outages result in lower solar only adoption. Is that interpretation correct? And if so, uh, would, would there be fewer solar only adoptions as outages increase? I would think Great there question. would be yeah, at so least a neutral effect. This is a, a wonderful question because it, uh... It, it gets at kind of some of the core findings of our study here. Um, so we, we actually showed two different things, and I'm going to share my screen again to, to try and uh, bring you back to that point, if that's okay, um, because it's just such an excellent question and, and really worth talking about. Um, so I'm going to come back to what you saw here. So what you saw is that uh, in other states outside of California, we actually did see if you have more outages, PV only declines. So that's consistent with what you're saying. In California, however, we see PV only is increasing. So let me talk about uh, those two findings and, and a little bit more about what they might be really meaning. So in, in other states, we see PV only declining. However, this decline in PV only in other states almost entirely goes to PV plus battery. So it's not that these people don't install solar anymore. It's that because of higher outages, they co-adopt. So that's really what, what's, what's going on. So the total solar actually increases. And so you're, you mentioned you thought it could be an, an almost, a, you know, potentially a neutral effect. I think what you have in mind probably is this dotted red line, which is the total solar, which includes co-adoption of PV plus battery and PV only, which is uh, and that, that actually slightly increases. So total solar increases with more outages. It, it does decrease with fewer outages, but not a lot. So if, if utilities um, spend a lot of time attempting to, uh, to uh, straight, do tree trimming, uh, underground lines, et cetera, it's, that's not gonna cut the solar market very much. I mean, it may it have a small impact, but, but almost neutral. But if you do see a lot more outages, then you, you do see quite a large increase. And again, with climate change, this is, this is potentially the world we're moving into despite efforts by, by utilities. So that's, a, 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 that's kind of the way to interpret other states. California is a little different. Now, California, you see people, uh, you see total solar going up in the same way, but what you see is that PV only also goes up in California. So why would that be? It could be that after outages, people are, are, are just uh, thinking more about solar and about energy independence and about what they can do. They might get to the point where they're thinking about may maybe even the fact that PV and battery was available makes them talk to the solar installers. And then maybe they get sticker shock and realize that PV and battery is just too expensive for them, right? And, and so, but they've already gone halfway through the process. They might as well put PV only on. It's still a pretty good deal. Um, 
So they end up installing PV only. So that's one potential story or narrative for what could be going on there. Um, we were able to rule out the possibility that people are putting in PV only along with inverters that allow them to, to um, island on PV only. There are a handful of inverters that allow you to do that. We, we actually dove into that. And, and identified those inverters and saw no real change, uh, no no real big uh, change. So these are mostly people who who can't island with their solar panels. Um, the, the ones who have PV and battery can island. They can they can uh, you know be backed up. But the PV only people still their their solar panels would go down if the grid goes down. Um, but uh, I think the salient story is probably the most likely story. They're just thinking about it. They know the PV battery is an option. They may have had friends with it, and then they go through the process and decide PV only is actually the the right um, path for them. So those are our, our explanations. Um, but we would uh, welcome uh, emails to to me or to others with with other explanations or thoughts. Excellent. Uh, thanks. There there were a couple of questions about uh, the data, in particular, uh, why Texas was included. There are a number of other states that aren't included as well. So just I did want to um, to highlight what what Ken had mentioned. This the data uh, for the solar plus storage um, installations are from the tracking the sun data set. So um, this data set is not a complete data set. It doesn't include all states. It doesn't include all systems in all states. Um, it is a sizable data set in, in numbers, uh, but it's not comprehensive. Uh, and so there are uh, states where we weren't able to get any data, uh, and uh, Texas is one of them, and a number of other states um, are not included in that data as well. So that, that explains um, why we aren't seeing every state in, in the slides um, that highlight state-level results. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, a question here. In the counterfactual model, the outage intensity increasing 20% is leading to a substantial increase in storage adoption. Is this the direct output of your choice model? Uh, the coefficient of the model is usually considered a local estimate, meaning that it is more valid near the original outage value. How do you validate it still? Uh, how do you validate it um, and still have the extra extrapolation power when outage intensity increases by 20% or even more? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, we it is an output of the choice model. Um, and uh, it's an output of the choice model in the sense that we uh, use the choice model to develop a set of parameters, including the relationship between outages and adoption. And we have a fairly flexible formulation that allows us to, to understand that. Um, so we have coefficients that, that tell us, you know, if outages increase or not, um, how does this, this impact uh, results? You are correct that the coefficient of a model is, is a local estimate. So then you want to look at what is the variation in the data that you actually are using to, uh, to identify or to pin down that, that local estimate. And Fortunately for us, the variation in the data is far more than 20%. We see large, large, large changes. So we're in some sense, you know, using periods of time and, and areas that have far fewer outages and periods of time and areas that have far more outages to pin down this relationship between the two. Um, it is possible that that relationship actually changes with, with the, the amount of outages. Um, and, and that's something we're not looking at. But we're, what we are looking at is a nice average value um, across, uh, you know, the, the variation that we do have or the, the differences in outages that we do have, which is far, far more than 20%. So we, we feel that the 20% uh, uh, estimate is well within the range that we can actually start talking about. You'll note, though, that we didn't say 50% or 100%. So we, we are very attuned to this, this exact critique and, and don't feel comfortable you know, doubling outages or sending outages down to zero or something like that. But uh, the 20% is very, very, very much within the range that I feel is, is something that we can feel comfortable with. It's a great question. Uh, great. So um, uh, a 
perhaps uh, another question. So are you saying that PV plus battery allows a facility to island in the case of an outage, whereas PV only does not allow islanding, except if a special inverter is installed? In that case, wouldn't that explain much of the negative PV only adoption with increased outages in non-California states? Because PV only doesn't help address an outage. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. So, so just to, to elaborate on that a little more, um, there are only a handful of inverters out there that, and again, we did some, some background research that if you put on a solar panel, uh, would, uh, but no battery, um, would allow you to, um, back up an outage. There are very, very few of those, those inverters that do it. It's, it's actually kind of a tough thing to do without, um, another source of, um, of voltage, uh, coming in. Um, so because of that, uh, you know, PV and battery does allow facilities to systems to island. So a home that has a PV and battery um, is all of the, the PV and battery inverters are designed to allow for islanding um, in the case of an outage. Uh, definitely the LG Chem one, definitely the Tesla Powerwall, uh, Generac, you, you name it, that they all allow you to island. Um, but, but PV only does not allow you to do it. Um, so that could be definitely playing a, a role in the negative PV only adoption with increased outages in the non California states. Because basically, you have increased outages, going PV only doesn't really help you with the increased outages <laughs> very much, um, if at all, unless you have one of those special inverters. And even then, it's, it's a really iffy thing. Like maybe in the middle of the day when so, the sun's really shining, it'll back you up, but, uh, but it's not going to back you up in the, at night or in the evening. It's not going to back you up if a cloud goes overhead. So that's part of the reason why uh, you don't people don't consider PV only as a reliable or, or even all that useful backup. So so that that is actually very much the explanation for why we saw that that negative relationship for PV only and why they all basically with higher outages, a, a lot of them are switching to PV plus battery. Excellent. Um, so. Uh, another question. In Puerto Rico, our research teams have seen a similar pattern of PV only and PV plus um, uh, energy storage in California, particularly spiking after hurricanes Irma and Maria, to which perhaps we can share insights. Um, have you considered a correlation between catastrophes such as a massive, uh, the massive wildfires to outage time increase? Yes, we've considered it. We have not estimated it. Um, we considered a lot of things, uh, but it's it's almost another paper, uh, a very interesting one, in fact. Um, but I think that there's clearly something going on with catastrophes and, and long outages. There are really um, a couple different types of outages in in our data. There are the outage from the from a catastrophe, a hurricane, a big wildfire. Sometimes those are multiple days. Here where I live in Connecticut, you can go for a week or more. Um, from a big hurricane that comes through and knocks out a ton of power lines or big winter storm. Um, but in, but a lot of outages are, are, you know, some malfunction happens and they're short outages. High percentage of outages are these kind of short, typical outages. Um, but that often don't bother people as much. People might not be so concerned having an outage for 20 minutes. Um, what is it about four hours is, is how much you're four or five hours and you need to be worried about your refrigerator. Right. So so once you start hitting four or five hours, it's when people start really getting uh, annoyed and, and wanting to spend money for defensive investments. It's a terrific point. And, and one reason why we didn't want to focus on that, as Ken mentioned, it's a completely different project at that point. Uh, these that level of catastrophe would have huge implications on the supply side as well. So if we're trying to look specifically at consumer demand for solar and solar plus storage options, we would not want to use variation in outages that is due to these catastrophic events that would lead to issues with you know trucks going out and, and actually installing solar itself. So by using this variation instead, we can focus more on the demand side. Yeah, it's a good point. We would we'd have to model the, su the supply side to do it. Um, but I think uh, understanding what's going on in Puerto Rico is incredibly important and incredibly interesting as well. Great. So uh, Brian actually answered this question, but I thought it would be worth uh, uh, repeating here. So the current adoption stage uh, position on the adoption S-curve of solar and PV is going to be different in different states. 
uh, especially considering California and other states, does this affect your model and results? Um, and Brian, feel free to <laughs> repeat uh, what you what you typed in here, uh, but wondering if there's anything else to add. Just that it, it, it's really a terrific point, and it's one reason why we actually ended up uh, using a more structural model um, in this research to try to capture the actual functional relationships, uh, the difference between California and a lot of these other states. Um, you know, there's there's large differences, and one of those is the baseline level of adoption. Uh, and therefore, you can see large effects on maybe the utility of co-adoption versus adopting solar as a standalone product outside of California. But when you have baseline adoption rates very, very small, the, 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 the total effect you're going to then see on aggregate adoption might not be as large. And that's why when Ken showed that graph on these aggregate effects, you actually saw larger effects in California because those baseline adoption rates were higher and you were on a steeper part of that response curve than you do in uh, the rest of the country. So it's a great question. Great. Um, a question, uh, did this analysis consider the impact of uh, NEM3 uh, and other regulatory barriers in California? Well, we can quickly say NEM3.0, um, is after our, th our data sample. So, so the answer is no. Um, if we had data through 2022 and 2023, then it'd be very interesting to start to include those factors. Um, we do account for changing uh, incentives over time. So we have the data on the incentives um, that the systems receive, whether they be a co-adopted system or a solar system. And we use those data to help us better uh, pin down the relationship between incentives and adoption. And that actually fundamentally is what is driving our results in the counterfactual where we are changing the incentives around. Um, a question, uh, are these res results residential only? Would commercial or industrial commercial customers who rely on energy supply as business essential and who are willing to pay more for reliability have different results? Um, so more PV battery to achieve reliability. You know, Naeem, you could probably speak better than I could about the extent to which commercial industrial is included in, in the data here, but these results are driven by residential. Um, uh, uh, absolutely. Scale systems. Um, a large commercial or industrial facility probably would not be in this data set. They, they might be putting in a much larger system. Uh, they probably would pay more for reliability. They may also have a generator as well. Um, they're a, a different market, um, and I think there's a whole set of, of different considerations that uh, that would occur when you start talking about, uh, you know, a large industrial facility or a large commercial facility. So these are all small scale systems. That said, I mean, I think I think the small scale systems do make up a very large portion of the market, um, and uh, and in it, you know, in, in addition. Um, when you think about it, comparing utility scale solar and batteries, that that's a huge portion of the, the at least megawatts being put in. It's probably the largest portion of the megawatts being put in. But what, but in understanding the number of decisions and how decisions are made, it's really useful to be focusing on uh, on just small scale systems rather than those who have a slightly larger system because the decision process would be different. Um, excellent. Let's see. Um, what type of incentives did you model in the adoption of PV and storage, uh, grants, tax credits, and were some incentives better at increasing uptake than others? Andres, you may want to, to take this on. We, we had the total you know, dollar value of the incentives, um, but we did not do an analysis uh, of point of sale grants versus tax credits. Um, we just kind of lump them in dollar values together. I think that's a really interesting uh, line of research that, that one could explore. Um, one of the interesting things with tax credits is if you don't have enough tax liability, you may not may or may not be able to, to take it. Um, you may, that may lead you into a leasing model. I should note that we do account for leasing in, in this, that, that hasn't come up yet, but we do have a, um, uh, variables for, for, for leasing. 
uh, whether it's a third party owned type system. So we're, we are accounting for, for this in, in there. Um, but Andres, do you want to add anything on the different types of incentives? No. Nope. Okay. That's great. So we, we don't, and I think that's a really interesting line of research. So but thanks for mentioning it. And so this is a little bit more of a comment. Uh, an interesting topic for future research would be the question of how alternative financing models, such as utility leasing, impact adoption rates, especially given the 30% cost adder for solar plus PV versus storage alone driving up out of pocket, pocket costs. I This was, I think, George Twig's uh, question. I think it's a really great point. Um, there are some really, there's some great work, including papers that come out of uh, LBNL and, and NREL and, and others about uh, solar leasing. Um, so uh, it, it's, you know, in third party ownership, it's definitely an important area to, to study. The intersection uh, between that and, uh, and co adoption is something that we implicitly are modeling, but we're not focusing on in this study. Um, we're not, you know, trying to get results about about leasing. We're trying to understand the aggregate market, um, but we do have room to potentially explore that further. There, it's, it's in the data. We do know if it's a third party owned system, so there are some things that we could do to have a, a better sense. Great. Uh, just a, a question on: Is it possible to make this recorded video available? And yes, absolutely. We will follow up um, in about a week with everyone who had registered for this webinar and uh, you all to um, make this to send the link to the video. It'll also be at uh, on our EMP. So that's the Electricity Markets and Policy Group at Berkeley Lab, the their website, so emp.lbl dot gov slash publications uh, and you'll uh, be able to view it there uh, it, it'll be linked through um, youtube okay so uh, let's see i we have a oh, uh, quick question on the source of data for the state ranking of outages Uh, the source of the data for the state now, all of our outage data comes from well, Andres actually I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to explain the data set a little bit more outage.us yeah so all the um, data comes from on, on outages come from the same source and if this is poweroutage.us this is our website and it's proprietary and we can through Yale got access to this data and uh, it's all coming from the same source and all the rankings and everything we use in the paper come from that source. Excellent. Uh, and with that, we are reaching the bottom of the hour. So I'd like to again thank uh, Ken um, for the presentation, Andres and Brian uh, for uh, supporting and uh, answering all the questions. We have uh, noted all the, the questions here and appreciate the, the input. Uh, feel free, again, to email any of us. We can send a, a draft uh, shortly for uh, this, this report. And as soon as it is published, it will also be on the EMP website, as well as um, um, the, the journal um, on the journal web pages, of course, as well. Uh, Excellent. So thanks again. Have a great rest of your day. And goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone.